Hi guys, because class is cancelled today, uh, I'm going to post this screencast or basically a link to this screencast. So last week we talked about uh, channels and we went through the functionality of a voltage gated channel, namely the potassium channel. Now today we're going to be talking about the ligand gated channel or the ligand gated channel where the opening and closing of the gate is dependent on the binding of the ligand itself. So how does that work? Well, so this works like so. So this is the acetylcholine receptor here, you can see on the screen. And the acetylcholine receptor transports sodium ions and potassium ions. But this channel can't open until and unless acetylcholine has bound to its receptor. So you can see here that acetylcholine binds to the receptor, the channel opens, and sodium and potassium ions flow through. So in this case, the ligand itself is not transported through the channel. One more time. So the channel is closed. There's no acetylcholine bound to the receptor. When acetylcholine binds to the receptor, there's a conformational change in this receptor which allows sodium and potassium ions to flow through this receptor. And this is still passive transport because there is no input of energy that is required. And of course, the acetylcholine receptor is very important during the transmission of the nerve impulse across synapses. Another channel we're going to be talking about is the water channel or aquaporin. So uh, you may have a question that why does water need a channel? Because it could probably diffuse to some extent through the membrane. Well, water needs a channel because it needs to sometimes flow very fast into the cell or even out of the cell. So um, that's why it needs a channel. The water channel was discovered by Peter Agre, who's a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore. And as you will notice, I've posted uh, Dr. Agre's paper on Moodle along with a number of questions you have to answer. So you have to read the paper, answer the questions, and that is basically your case study number one. And that is due on Monday, next Monday. Okay, so I believe that would be February 10th. So this is what aquaporin looks like. So this is one subunit, and you're looking at it from the side. So this is the second subunit. But if you look at it from the top, so this is the pore through which water passes, and these are the four different subunits. So aquaporin has a total of four subunits. So as you can see, this is the structure of water, the negatively charged, the partially negatively charged oxygen, and the partially positively charged um, hydrogen, so H2O. In the beginning, when water flows through the channel, it has its oxygen down. So it's flowing through, flowing through, flowing through, and then in the middle of the channel, it reverses its direction, like so. This is because there are positively charged residues of amino acids lining the channel. So oxygen negatively charged is sort of attracted to these, but then it turns around where the um, positively charged asparagines are actually located. So this again is a structure of water and we know, we've discussed why uh, it is partially charged. It's because the oxygen pulls electrons to itself, giving it a delta negative charge and the hydrogens get electrons pulled away, giving them a delta positive charge. So as it's flowing through the channel, as the water molecules move through the channel, um, they go in single file and 
They orient themselves in the local electric field formed by the atoms of the channel wall. On entering the water molecules face with the oxygen atoms down, this is the red, the oxygen atoms in red facing down, and midstream they reverse orientation facing with the oxygen atom up because of the positively charged asparagines. So today, uh, and last week, or Monday actually, we covered transporters. We talked about ligand-gated channels today, such as the acetylcholine channel. We also talked about the water channel. And on Monday, we talked about voltage-gated channels, or the potassium channel. So next week, we will be talking about active transport. So active transport requires an input of energy and the, and it can be of two types. There can be primary pumps and then they can there can be secondary pumps. The primary pumps are driven by an energy source which can either be ATP, light or electrons. And secondary pumps or secondary porters are driven by a secondary source of energy and not directly by a source of energy. Okay, that's all for today. I hope you guys will stay safe and study hard.